Said I'm not Anglo-Saxon Got me the freezing mail To better understand the history of Dark Age England we need to look at England's contemporary neighbours. Undoubtedly, the big boy in the block for the period of the English Dark Ages was the Merovingian Frankish Kingdom. They were, after all, just 30 kilometres away across the English Channel. We need to define the Dark Ages. I would say the beginning could be counted as circa 430 AD, a generation or so after the departure of the last two Roman legions, and the end, around 600 AD, when we start seeing coins being minted once again in what was the Roman province of Britannia. This began the remonetization of the economy after nearly two centuries without any coins being circulated. But initially, the use of these coins was limited to the purchase of foreign luxuries for high-status individuals. Equally, the records of the dynasties of the Anglo-Saxon kings become much more complete around 600 as well. In chapters 1, five and six of the Frisian Enigma, we will see the extent and the importance of the Frankish Frisian trading network throughout England and Northwest Europe in the 6th, 7th, 8th and even into the 9th century. In the last hundred years of this period, from the mid-8th century onwards, this commerce took place under the control of the Carolingian dynasty. The collapse of this North Sea trade was due to the large increase in Viking raids from around the middle of the 9th century. From my research, I try to understand more about the perhaps very dark nature of the reciprocal trade between the small, nascent, mostly Anglo-Saxon-led kingdoms in South and Eastern England and the Merovingian Frankish kingdom just across the English Channel. I had to come to the conclusion that the only produce that these petty Anglo-Saxon kings would have to sell to the Franks were slaves. These would have been captured in raids and warfare and destined for the Byzantine Empire. This was a very mercenary way of acting. The period of the 150 years following the Roman departure in 407 AD is particularly interesting. We look at the possibility that at one point in the Dark Ages, the kings of some of these small English kingdoms actually owed allegiance to the Merovingian monarchs. To give an indication of the importance of Frankish Frisian commerce with the Anglo-Saxon leg kingdoms in the early 7th century, we only have to look at the contents of the royal ship burial at Sutton Hoo circa 625 AD. This find shows without a shadow of a doubt that this trade was in full swing at this period. Quoting from the Purpose of the Sutton Hoo Coins by Philip Grierson, The purse found at Sutton Hoo contained 42 gold objects. 37 of them were Merovingian coins of the last decades of the 6th and the first half of the 7th century. Three were unstruck circular blanks and two were small rectangular ingots. The identifiable coins were coined between 575 and 625 AD. This is the way the Sutton Hoo ship burial was dated. In this hall, certain identifiable coins were made at various mints in the Wickers in Pontia area along the other side of the English Channel, just opposite South East England. This is the self-same area that had supplied gold Belgae coins to the Belgae tribes in Britain from the 1st century BC to facilitate commerce some 700 years before. If we look at the contents of the Sutton Hoo ship burial, we see that the unique source of the minted gold coins, the beautiful East Mediterranean silver bowls and plates, and other Byzantine goods, speak volumes of the well-established and documented Frankish-Byzantine trade connections. This bilateral commerce across the Mediterranean is described by Henri Perenne in the Ville de Moyen-Age, and the distribution of the goods in the North Sea by the Frisians is portrayed by Stefan Lebeck in many of his brilliant works. I have to repeat, in the Frankish kingdom just across the channel from England there were no Dark Ages. The Merovingian king's lives during the period of the Dark Ages in Britain are generously documented. In France there is historical continuum from Caesar's invasions right up until today. We can name and identify every king of the Merovingian dynasty and there are many of them because of the Frankish practice of dividing the kingdom equally amongst all the living sons of the defunct king. We can identify and describe the lives of every king of the Carolingian dynasty, and then the same for every king up until the French Revolution. We will see that in Britain we rely mainly and very heavily on only a very few historical sources for the Dark Age period of English history. These sources are Bede, 
Gildas, and the Anglo-Saxon Chronicles. It has been suggested that some of the contents of Bede's history may have been cribbed from the Frankish history, Historia Francorum, written in the late 6th century AD by the later Beatified Gregory of Tours. This history recounts how the Franks came to the dominant position that they held in the ex-Roman Gallic provinces. The continuity just across the channel in Merovingian France wasn't just documentary. As is so well indicated by the finds at Sutton Hoo, Merovingian kings continued to mint gold and other coins throughout the period of the English Dark Ages. After the Romans left Britain in 407 AD, coinage and the monetary economy disappeared for nearly 200 years. In Dark Age England, before 600 AD, gold coins are just gold bullion to be weighed to calculate their value. The first British gold coins to be minted since the end of the Roman occupation date from around 600 AD. These coins were copies of the Merovingian gold coins that they are often found with. They have the same shape, mass and purity. The English versions are referred to as Thrymasses. Merovingian gold coins had started out a century or so before as clones of Byzantine Tremisis. Byzantine Tremisis were worth a third of a Byzantine gold solidus. However, by the end of the 6th century, the Merovingian coins were no longer the equivalent in weight and size to the equivalent Byzantine coins, but they were still of the same purity. Merovingian Tremisis coins even followed the different styles on the Byzantine coins over the years. The Frisians also minted their own version of this same type of coin. It had the same weight and purity as the Merovingian Tremisis. And all the types of these coins, even if they are no longer exactly the same value, were used in the substantial bilateral trade between Byzantine Empire and the Frankish realm. Finds of Byzantine Tremisis are quite rare in Northwest Europe. The one found in the Crondall Hall, pictured further back, is thought to have been detached from the necklace to replace a fake coin. To put it simply, as far as I can ascertain, the Frisians took care of the maritime logistics and the Merovingian Franks, with their abundant and good quality convertible gold coinage, took care of the finance. We see then that during the English Dark Ages, the Franks were the strong regional power and the Frisian Kingdom at this time of Magna Frisia was the secondary regional power. Both definitely meddled in the affairs of East Anglia, Kent and Southern England during the 5th, the 6th and even perhaps the 7th century AD. This can be seen by the distribution of early Merovingian coins in South East England, which, as we have seen, have almost the same distribution pattern as pre-Roman occupation Belgae coins from the continent. We see that influence as well in trade goods in provenance from Byzantine to the Merovingian Frankish realm. In this particular case, we see that an Eastern Mediterranean copper bucket was found near Sutton Hoo burial, but not in it. These magnificent buckets have been found all over the post-Roman world, in Turkey, Spain, and the Isle of Wight. The more interesting case is the cast bronze bowl, which was actually found in the Sutton Hoo burial and not associated with it. This type of bowl is often wrongly described as a Coptic bowl. They originated from lots of different East Mediterranean workshops of the Byzantine Empire. Bowls of this type have been found on more than 20 sites associated with Anglo-Saxon occupation. This means that the Sutton Hoo burial isn't a one-off, but one of very many sites that prove there was an extensive commerce between Dark Age England and the Merovingian Franks, and their maritime middlemen were the Frisians. We see local Dark Age English copies of Frankish apparel accessories, especially in Kent, such as fibulas and buckles. We can't either ignore the influence and the effect of dynastic marriages between Anglo-Saxon kings and local nobles' daughters and Frankish and perhaps even prin Frisian princesses. If we go back to the Père d'Orléans' description of the arrival of the first Saxons, one of the first acts of Hengist, the first Saxon invader, was to bring his daughter to England to marry Vortiger. As far as the Merovingians are concerned, I have used the example of Bertha, a daughter of a minor Merovingian king, Caribert, who was married to the Kentish king Athelbert, well before 588. Part of the agreement concerning this marriage was that Bertha 
brought Bishop Luthard to Canterbury to say Mass for the Princess. This marriage wasn't a one-off. I have identified at least two other dynastic marriages between Frankish princesses and Anglo-Saxon kings during the English Dark Ages. I've tried hard to work out the reason why this abundant history of the Merovingian Frankish kingdom and the well-documented Frankish Frisian trading network seems to be almost totally ignored by British historians. And this, in spite of the fact that it really is the key to a better understanding of England during the Dark Ages. A lot of this history of the Frankish Frisian trading networks, but not all, has been translated into English. And even the books that haven't been translated are in French. I explain more completely in Chapter 6 of the Frisian Enigma that maybe it was for past jingoistic reasons that British historians have ignored so completely the French connection with the Merovingian Frankish Kingdom during the Dark Age period of English history. Perhaps, and there is some proof of this, the history of the Dark Age period in England may have been fudged somewhat under the influence of the Westminster Parliament in the 18th century. This would have been done to justify Parliament placing on the English throne George I. He was the non-English speaking elector from Hanover, which of course made him a Saxon. To sum up, there is ample archaeological evidence of widespread commerce between South East England and the Merovingian Frankish Kingdom. It's easy to prove that the Merovingian Frankish and Frisian traders in the later Dark Ages had their own local counters in many English settlements. The kings of the first Frankish dynasty, the Merovingians, were les Francaliens, a people that hailed from the region bordering the salty Rhine estuary next to the Frisians and much closer to Britain than Saxony or southern Jutland. There are some 19th century French historians who actually ask the question whether les Francaliens were actually part of the Frisian peoples. Henri Prien in Les Villes de Moyen-Âge describes so well the enormous differences between the first Frankish Merovingian dynasty and the second dynasty, the Carolingians, named after Carolus Magnus, or as we know him better, Charlemagne. He was part of the Pepin Martel family, the founders of the second Frankish dynasty. They had been Maire de Palais, a title that described the top dog nobles and generals under the final Merovingian kings. It was the Maire de Palais, Charles Martel, who was father of Pepin le Bref, the first Carolingian king. It was Charles Martel who led the to not totally Frankish armies that turned back the invading Muslim hordes near Poitiers in 732. He then went on and in 734 overran most of the existing Frisian territory. This military invasion was undertaken nominally under the last Merovingian kings and proves the power had already in reality passed the Martel family, even though this was 20 years before the fall of the last Merovingian Wafinion, Lazy King, in 751. The Pepin Martel family had seized the crown with the close help of the Roman Catholic Church, who they'd always supported more than the Merovingian kings had. This church had become radicalised as a result of the Islamic occupation of Christian lands. This partnership led to a crusading religious fervour. Pagans would no longer be tolerated. This crusade started 20 years before Pepin le Bref became the first Carolingian Frankish king. Pagan Europe was almost totally devastated successively by the armies of Charles Martel, Pepin le Bref and, and above all the pagan slaughterer-in-chief Charlemagne. Saxons and Frisians fleeing Charlemagne took refuge in the Scandinavian lands, and some of their descendants were almost certainly part of the initial Viking raids. The Lindisfarne raid in 795 shows that, to begin with, the Vikings only attacked and pillaged churches, monasteries and abbeys, as revenge for the devastation by the Franks of the pagan places of worship and the pagan peoples. However, these raids very soon became generalised in Europe wide. This short summary of Frankish history shows that it's impossible to separate British history in the Dark Ages from the history of the neighbours that were just across the English Channel. How could we say otherwise, seeing as the Viking raids, which led to an invasion of England, were a direct result of Charlemagne's bloody witch hunt against the pagans? Well, that's the end of the intro and prelude. Um, if I get enough hits on this, I'll put up chapter one. I've started it already, but I'm not going to do it if I don't get enough hits.